Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Adam Savitt, and I'm happy to welcome you back to the Center for Security Policy for our Wednesday webinar series. To check out the schedule, go to securefreedom.org and check under the webinar tab. I'll also give you a preview of upcoming events at the end of today's broadcast. Today's a special program on the occasion of the launch of the Center's Advisory Board, featuring former Congressman Pete Hoekstra, Peter King, and Gil Goodnecht, and former Pentagon advisor Chris Harvin. They'll be discussing Biden's national security policy at 100 days and previewing tonight's speech to a joint session of Congress. Please note that you are in listen-only mode. You can submit your text questions in the Q&A box in the GoToWebinar panel, and I'll read as many questions as possible at the end of the program. This event is being recorded and will be available on our YouTube channel, youtube.com slash securefreedom, and on our website at securefreedom.org. With that, I'll hand it to the center's president and CEO, Fred Flights, to introduce our moderator. Thank you, Adam, and I'd like to thank all our viewers for, for joining this very important webinar during which we're gonna discuss the damage that Joe Biden's national security is doing to our freedom and security in his first 100 days, and also to announce our new advisory board. Since Biden was inaugurated, the center has changed its method of operations to become a shadow national security council to encourage Biden officials to make responsible foreign policy decisions, hold them accountable when they don't, and to document the damage that we think they're doing to our national security. And to do that, we have really upped our game in terms of media, in terms of our analysis, and in terms of our congressional contacts. And we have really good stuff going on on the Hill. I can't talk about it publicly to help members of Congress scrutinize Biden national security policies and to scrutinize his nominees to key national security positions. And I'm very proud of what we have been accomplishing. Now, part of this effort is to reestablish the center's advisory board. And this is gonna be a body of, of distinguished individuals who will be advising the center's leadership on vital matters of national security, defense, foreign policy, to help point us in the right direction and amplify the work that is being done by the center staff. I, I'm, I'm proud to say our chairman is someone who I knew as a chairman in the past when he hired me to work on the House Intelligence Committee staff, Ambassador Pete Hoekstra. He was President Trump's ambassador to the Netherlands. And uh, Pete is going to be joined by an extraordinary group of people, six former congressmen, Michelle Bachman, Gil Gutenick, Peter King, Sue Myrick, John Shattuck, and Robert Schaefer. They will be joined by former CIA Director James Woolsey, former Ambassador Kenneth Blackwell, former Deputy Assistant Secretary of Defense for Intelligence General William Boykin, Professor Angela Cotevilla, Senior Pentagon Advisor Christopher Harvin, two former U.S. diplomats, Todd Hunziker and Pam Pryor, a former senior Trump State Department official, Elen Poblet, and someone I think you, you probably know well, Victoria Tenzing, a Washington attorney and former Deputy Assistant, Sec uh, uh, Deputy Assistant Attorney General, and Barbara Winston, who is director of the Center's New York Regents. We are so fortunate to have this distinguished group joining the Center team to help us up our game to keep our nation safe and free. And we're going to be having more events where we're going to use their expertise and pick their brains uh, uh, to get the job done. So I'm proud to say we have a handful of, of this large group on this call today. Uh, uh, Congressman Hoekstra will be chairing this webinar with Congressman Gutenick and Peter King, as well as with Christopher Hart. So with that, I am going to get off the call and give our new chairman uh, the reins of this session. Pete. Hey, thank you, Fred. It, uh, number one, it's great to join the Center for Security Policy. I've enjoyed the uh, you know the first three months that I've been at the organization. Um, yeah, you know, and I'm glad that uh, I can join uh, a couple of my former colleagues, Pete King uh, and Gil Gutnick, uh, in kind of previewing uh, tonight's speech and also taking a look at uh, President Biden's first 100 <clears throat> days. Of course, we're also joined by Chris Harvin. Uh, you know, he is a uh, he worked at the Pentagon, but uh, you know, I, I got to know Chris uh, because he was also very much involved with uh, the president uh, and the vice president during the Trump administration. So he can also preview, you know, what goes into uh, a speech like tonight. 
uh, as the as an administration gets ready for their first uh, address by their president uh, to a joint session of Congress. I think uh, Gil, Peter, and I are going to be very interested in what the feel and dynamics of this speech are going to be tonight, because uh, it's going to be to a packed house, uh, but it's going to be to a different packed house than what uh, the three of us experienced uh, when we were there. Uh, you know, the aisles and the uh, and the chamber packed shoulder to shoulder uh, with foreign ambassadors, other dignitaries, and the chamber was packed. Uh, tonight, it will be a packed house, but it will be somewhere around 250 uh, to 300 people, uh, and they will be scattered on the House floor. They will be in the visitors gallery. Uh, it's going to be very interesting to see exactly what kind of dynamics are going to be present uh, there tonight. Yeah. We're focusing uh, today, we'll pro focus primarily on national security issues. Uh, and in the buildup to this speech, it looks like the president is going to be focused primarily on domestic policy issues, but you never know exactly what's going to happen. There may be some surprises. Obviously, we're very interested in you know, some of the key highlights uh, and of, of these first 100 days. Uh, you know, what's happening from a security standpoint on the border? What's happening uh, you know, now that uh, climate has moved back into one of the top uh, national security challenges uh, as identified by this administration, China, the Middle East, uh, Iran, and those kinds of things. But uh, I'm gonna turn it over to, uh, to my colleagues. We're gonna start uh, first with Peter King, former chairman of the Homeland Security Committee. Uh, along, you know, he and I went to Washington, got there the same year, 1993. He decided to stay a little longer than what I did, but uh, Peter, it's great to be with you. We also served on the Intelligence <laughs> Committee together. So we will turn it over to you for your comments. Thank you, Pete. Actually, we didn't serve together on the Intelligence Committee. I served under you. You were the boss. You were the, <laughs> you were the guy calling the shots. But service owner, thank you for your service. And uh, again, the great job you did as ambassador. And to be back with Gil. Again, maybe we have our own uh, sort of room Congress here. Uh, to me, tonight's speech, I'm going to be looking for several things. Because my biggest disappointment with the Biden administration is not even that he seems to be going to the left, not only that the, that the uh, progressive wing seems to be dominant, but I don't see any overall policy other than to be anti-Trump. I think uh, the best or the worst example of that or the most poignant example is his border policy. Uh, I could almost understand if, if the president wanted to come in and create a new policy, if he wanted to superimpose a policy. If you wanted to change parts of a previous policy, I may not agree with that, but I'd understand it. In this case with the border, it seems obvious what he did, he just dismantled as much as he could of what President Trump had in place and was working for the last several years and then had nothing to replace it with, no substitute. They're caught totally off guard. And I'm afraid that that is almost his policy around the world. Uh, certainly when you go to the Middle East. Uh, and, and by the way, you know, getting back to the border, that is a real threat. I mean, we have to, apart from the social uh, pressures, the economic pressures of having people come in, uh, also with COVID, uh, people coming in who are uh, testing positive for COVID and still being released into the uh, middle of the country, have all of that. But, you know, there is a, uh, the rest of the world follows everything we're doing. And this is, it can open it up for terrorists to come in from the Middle East, uh, for drug abusers to come in, drug, drug peddlers to come into the country, cartels. They have this access they would not have had before. So those are real serious security issues at the border. Also, the fact that he's implemented these policies really without consulting or talking with uh, governments like Mexico, which had changed their policies to satisfy the Trump administration. And those policies are working. So that's 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 to me is the overriding issue with the border. Not just the policies are wrong, but he has nothing in place uh, to substitute other than to say, that Kamala Harris is going to be in charge, and then she says she's not going to the border. Uh, she's going to have phone conversations or Zoom conversations or whatever conversations with uh, a Latin American leaders, which will get us nowhere unless there's real uh, muscle behind it. Now, with the Middle East, he again seems desperate to get back into an agreement with Iran, making it somehow feel as if we are uh, those in need of an agreement, uh, that Iran is holding the cards, and Iran is responding in, in a very tough way. They're, the Biden administration is reaching out and the uh, and, and Iran is pushing them aside. Iran is more uh, arrogant than ever. And we are negotiating from a position of weakness in that Biden, the Biden people have made it clear that they want an agreement. 
Uh, they want a new nuclear agreement. They want to bring back the old agreement, even though it's obviously not working. And Iran has uh, consistently and continually violated it, uh, even when it was in place. And also the fact that we are obviously so uh, cold toward Israel, toward Netanyahu, uh, whether people like Netanyahu or not, and I do, but even if I didn't, he is the leader of our closest ally and the only democracy in the Middle East a country. And I can uh, say this, both being on the Intelligence Committee, Homeland Security Committee, there's probably no country in the world that we share more intelligence with back and forth than the uh, U.S. and Israel. And to be put that in any way at risk, and now, of course, the allegations coming out about John Kerry, about what he may or may not have told Iran, about Israeli operations, all of that, to me, uh, can undo a lot of what the good that was achieved by President Trump in the Middle East. You know, the Abraham Accords, they were uh, phenomenal. You think of all the years we were trying to get countries even to acknowledge that Israel was there, that it exists. And now you had four Arab leaders at, at the White House with Netanyahu actually signing a, signing accords. That was unprecedented. And uh, it's essential that we keep that going. And I, I just think that Biden administration is creating a disunion there. One place which I do think uh, so far at least is saying the right things is with Asia and Taiwan. Uh, and so in that limited, not limited, but in that area, I, I think that uh, there does seem to be some hope, even though I thought that Blinken took, allowed himself to take too much, too much abuse at his uh, you know, first meeting with the uh, Chinese. Uh, and another thing which is not technically a foreign issue, but I think it's going to, or a security issue, but I think it's going to hurt us around the world, is the way that the president and his administration and the UN ambassador was our spokesman to the world, the way they talk about the racism in this country, the way they denigrate the police, that sends a, to me a very a, a sign of weakness around the world. And to have our uh, UN ambassador, I uh, compare her, let's say, to Pat Moynihan, who did nothing but defend the US at the UN, or uh, most recently, Nikki Haley, to an ambassador now who seems to be a self-hating American. So uh, I'm really concerned tonight as to what uh, direction uh, President Biden is going to take the country. If he's going to be positive, he's going to lay out an affirmative agenda. Uh, which at least then we can debate, or if he's just going to try to dismantle the uh, Trump policy. With that, I've probably gone on long enough, but I don't want to, again, thank you all for the opportunity. Uh, Peter, do you think he's going to talk much about foreign affairs tonight? I really don't don't know. I think he has to, he has to lay down some markets. So he has to reassure uh, uh, countries like Jordan and Egypt and Israel and the Middle East, also the countries that signed on to the Abraham Accords, that we are going to be firm in, in the Middle East. Uh, uh, other, otherwise, you're going to empower Iran, and that uh, also does you know, empower Russia because they have uh, obviously a closer relationship with uh, Iran. I mean, my experience in the Middle East is really all I understand is the is the show of, of strength and resolve. And if he's going to be undermining that in any way, I think that can weak that can really cause the Middle East to unravel. As far as Europe, I'm, again, I'm not certain what his policy is there. It's uh, again just to show that he's more friendly to European leaders. He wants them to like him. Uh, I, I don't think being liked means that much with foreign policy. Uh, and as far as the, uh, the border, I don't know if he's going to address that as a security issue or just something else to try to blame on, on uh, President Trump. Great. Thank you. Uh, we'll, we'll turn it over to, uh, to Gil, uh, bring us a unique perspective from uh, you know, the great state of Minnesota. Gil, welcome. Thank you for joining us. Gil, I think you're muted. This, there we go. Okay, thank you, Peter, and and it's great to be here, and it's great to be with uh, both of you, uh, Peters, uh, who really are experts in national security. My background is not that heavily in national security, but but I do have some observations about what I think the president's speech is going to be like. But let me lay a little groundwork as a former member. I think you should always understand that when we have these speeches by presidents uh, to joint sessions of Congress, in many respects, the members of Congress and the distinguished guests, the Supreme Court justices and so forth, are, are mostly props. And uh, the, the speech is really directed at the American people. And in this case, I think, to a certain degree, to people around the world. Uh, there's a whole lot that uh, the American people don't know about this president. And, and I think as, as Peter King pointed out, uh, there's a lot of 
unease, I think, about what is the foreign policy now of the United States of America. Now, whether you agreed with Donald Trump or you disagreed with Donald Trump, uh, there were very few people around the world who didn't understand exactly where he stood. Uh, he was very blunt and very forthright in terms of dealing with NATO, in terms of dealing with China. And, and, and I think in some respects, that helped our, our foreign policy. And as a matter of fact, I would say in most respects, I think that was very helpful in creating a foreign policy that everyone understood. But I want to go back to the speech, too, in, in some respects, because I think it was the detective Sherlock Holmes who said that it was important to listen for the dog that didn't bark. And I think in many respects, we should listen tonight uh, to what the president doesn't say. Now, I think we can almost guarantee that he's not going to give many compliments to his predecessor. Uh, for example, the enormous progress we've made with the, the virus and, and what we now, something like 80 million Americans, maybe more than that now, have had their at least one vaccination. That's largely in thanks to what uh, President Trump did with his Operation Warp Speed. We are light years ahead of what's going on in Europe and many other parts of the world in terms of getting people vaccinated. I don't think uh, this president will give the former president much credit on that. I also don't think he's going to talk much about the problems we face relative to China. Um, the Chinese are becoming increasingly belligerent. Um, I think they feel like they've got a patsy in the White House now. Uh, so far, he's been pretty silent in terms of what he's going to do with tariffs. Uh, and it will be interesting whether that dog barks tonight or not about how he, where he stands with China and what we'll do uh, with the tariffs. Um, as Peter mentioned, I think one of the greatest national security threats we, we face right now is on our southern border. And this is, a, this is a situation that's, I think, really going from bad to worse. And it was predicated on that, this whole idea that everybody was going to get amnesty. And so the trailers started filling up all the way down into Honduras to bring people uh, to our southern borders. We know, for example, that there have been some uh, people that have tried to cross the border who have been caught who were from the Middle East. We don't know how many may have gotten through. Uh, again, I don't think the president wants to talk much about that because most Americans have figured out that this is not something that Trump created. This is something that has been created since uh, the Biden administration came in. Uh, back to China, I think one other thing that he will probably not want to talk about, and that is the role that his son uh, may have played in, uh, in helping the Chinese get some things that perhaps we didn't want them to know about. And I would hope that that's something that the center would spend a little bit of energy in trying to find out exactly the relationship that he had with the Chinese and whether or not he wasn't helpful and getting some technology that we don't want them to have. Um, finally, I'll say that uh, well, two things. One thing we will hear a lot about tonight, I think, is the Green New Deal. But what we won't hear about is how much it's really going to cost. Um, and, and there's another area. I'm doing some, some of my own research. I, I've done some work for energy companies. I'm a all of the above kind of a person. I believe in solar energy. I believe in wind power. But I also understand that one of the reasons that we in the West enjoy this incredibly high standard of living that we do is because of the incredible efficiency of hydrocarbon fuels. And the numbers are just amazing. For the, the people who may be joining us on the seminar and you have not seen uh, the PragerU video that was done by one of the uh, people at, at the Manhattan Institute, when you begin to see how incredibly efficient relative to electric, uh, relative to solar, relative to wind, uh, how incredibly efficient hydrocarbon fuels are, uh, it's really eye opening. And that's something that's not going to be talked about. And the other thing he's not going to talk about is how many people are going to be dislocated. We know that literally 10,000 people who work on, on pipelines have lost their jobs in the first 100 days of the Biden administration. You know, the idea that they can all be retrained to do other things is uh, is interesting, but I think it's just it's not practical. Uh, so there are a whole lot of things I think we won't hear tonight. Finally, though, I will mention the budget. You know, I served on the budget committee for a number of years back when I was on the budget committee. We actually balanced the federal budget. It can be done. It could be done again. 
but there doesn't seem to be much willpower on either side of the political aisle right now to rein in on some of the spending. As a matter of fact, when you look at what's in this, uh, the, the, the next phase is, well, what was in the stimulus bill that passed and what's going to be in uh, the infrastructure bill, it appears that, uh, you know, that Washington is going hog wild with programs, uh, as I say, with they're spending money that they do not have on programs that probably cannot work. And uh, as I've said before, when talking about the budget, I'm a supply sider, and I happen to believe that if you allow people to keep more of their own money to, to spend and invest it themselves, they will spend and invest it smarter than the federal government will do on their behalf. But I have to admit that that's a theory. But here's a fact. Government spending will be paid for. <clears throat> it will either be paid for with higher taxes or it will be paid for with higher inflation. We won't hear much about the, the cost of all this spending tonight, but here's the point. It will be paid for. And it appears to me that this administration has determined that this new spending, all of this enormous new spending, is going to be paid for with both higher inflation and higher taxes, both of which hurt consumers and, and hurt, hurt the U.S. economy. But, but interestingly enough, they hurt the people at the lower levels of our uh, economic strata more than they, they hurt the wealthy. The wealthy can go on just fine. So tonight will be an interesting thing. Most of the comments that the president's going to make have been focus group. Uh, the people who are admitted to the House chambers will be props. The speech is really directed at, at, uh, at Americans and other consumers around the world. It's going to be very, very different than speeches we've heard in the past. And uh, I kind of look forward to hearing what he has to say and what he doesn't have to say. Thanks, Gil. Uh, so you've heard from uh, you know three of us who were always sitting in the chairs waiting to hear and seeing what a president was going to say. And we, I think, what was the longest we were ever there, Peter? Two, two and a half hours with Bill Clinton at one time? Yeah, he went on forever one night. God, he... <laughs> <laughs> on and on. I think, that, I think that was before Gil maybe got there, but uh, no, no, it, it, I was there, and uh, the, the old senator from uh, uh, from South Carolina, Strom Thurmond, uh, apparently that he was said he leaned over to some of his uh, colleagues that were sitting beside him and said, "Is there going to be an, an intermission?" <laughs> <laughs> Great. So, uh, but you know, there are people on the other side that prepare these things uh, for us. And as Gil said, they focus group, they test every sentence, they test every word, uh, every idea before it goes out there. Not necessarily looking at what the impact is going to be on Congress, uh, but how that message is going to be received by uh, by the American people and by audience uh, internationally, uh, and those types of things. And one person that's worked on that side. Uh, of these types of events is uh, Chris Harvin. Uh, Chris, thank you for joining us. Uh, we're looking for your insights. Well, I appreciate the opportunity, uh, Ambassador Hoekstra, um, Fred, Congressman King, uh, Con Congressman Gutnick. Um, honored to join you today. Um, thank you for the opportunity. And um, I just wanted to um, kind of start with sort of talking about some of the ways, uh, the importance of these speeches. Um, sort of how they came about. You know, uh, the American presidents have a, a handful of ways they can address uh, to sort of break through that daily news media um, and a lot and make these big statements. Um, some is in an Oval Office address, uh, others is in the State of the Union, and then of course the address to a joint Congress tonight. You know, the State of the Union messaging um, is usually given once a year in January or February. Um, and the president usually talks about important issues facing Americans, offers ideas on solving the nation's problems, uh, and includes suggestions on new laws and policies. As a courtesy in the first year, the president typically addresses a joint session, but not as a state of the union. Um, it's called a speech to a joint session. In Biden's administration, they've labeled this as an address to a joint session of Congress. And I really think that um, uh, this supplies him with a really big stage. Uh, one that he hasn't really addressed the nation yet. He was very sort of controlled in the campaign. Um, from a media perspective, they used a lot of local reporters. The, the questions were pre-approved. Uh, and, and looking at this now, even the White House spends more time sort of punning issues 
than really addressing issues. It's more protecting the president in these in these press conferences and, and keeping him away from the media as such. Um, so I think tonight he's really, as a person, uh, as a president, he's really going to try to unify his message. He's really going to highlight the country's pandemic response, try to take credit what the past administration did, sort of elevate what he's done. Um, and I think he wants to really spotlight his agenda moving forward, which, you know, it's the second part of this jobs and infrastructure plan. You know, I know we touched on some of the foreign policy, um, but I really think that in national security, I think a bulk of this is going to really set the stage um, for for what's moving forward. Um, and he's going to want to like in Obama's first, you know, first year, they really pushed the budget. They really pushed their pet projects. And I really feel like that's something they're going to push tonight. Um, as with any stage, these visuals are enormous. A lot of work goes in behind the scenes on carefully crafting this message, looking at polls, uh, potentially even message testing and rehearsing this. Um, if you think about um, in, in uh, Trump's State of the Union address, you know, Nancy Pelosi um, was very rude. She was highly visible shredding uh, the address to Congress in February 2020. Um, you still hear a lot about Congressman Wilson and his outburst of you lied. Uh, during Obama's State of the Union. So you really have this, this um, ability to garner a stage and drive media for the next week to push an agenda. Um, typically, as, as um, Congressman King and Congressman Gutnick uh, mentioned, um, typically you have a joint session that you have all members of the House and the Senate, you know, their guests, the cabinet secretaries, the Supreme Court justices. But mostly tonight, the chamber won't be filled. It'll be spread out and it'll be full by, by COVID standards but you won't have that bipartisan um, chamber that you usually have. Um, I also think that um, the president sets the tone for these and he really controls this. So I think he has to have worked with the speaker on who's attending, how they're attending, uh, et cetera. Um, you know, I think, there, I think we mentioned there'd be two to 300 people in the chamber versus, you know, that's about a sixth of the level it would normally be full. Um, we'll only have the Secretary of State and the Secretary of Defense there and only Chief Justice Roberts there tonight. Um, it's also the first time uh, that two women have been seated behind the president. So the optics will be different than in the past. Um, and, you know, with the House out of session for the week, you know, most of the House Republicans will probably not be in attendance. Um, I also think that a lot will skip the event. Um, so Biden will be speaking to a mostly friendly audience. Um, that he'll receive a lot of sort of uh, cheer. Um, I think that other, um, Congressman King, I believe, was the one that touched on this, that some of the other traditions of the speech have been jettisoned uh, for the address. Um, lawmakers can't bring guests. You know, they've, they've um, removed um, any of the drama and speculation of how the chamber will react. Um, and uh, there won't be guests of the first lady in the gallery. And so Biden will have some challenges when he speaks basically because he's not going to be able to humanize his policy and point out individuals uh, that have real life experiences to his policy. Um, so it won't have that manufactured feel good moment that we've seen in past joint joint addresses to Congress. Um, and as we talked about briefly um, earlier, um, his audience really isn't the chamber as much as it is the American people. Um, you know, it'll be um, well, it'll be the lawmakers and it'll extend to Americans watching from home. But I think the international community is really going to be watching. You know, what is the impact? We talk, you know, America's divided. We have a lot of issues socially that we're, we're battling. Uh, we have the budget issues. We have a lot of this spending programs going forward. What's the impact on the world? A lot of the world will be watching. Um, I think we're going to see Biden, um, his speechwriters will carefully craft uh, a speech that's part of a victory lap, taking credit for a lot of things in the first hundred days, uh, but yet he really has to have a very effective sales pitch moving forward. Um, the White House wants to show that the president's in control and that he can deliver a speech. Um, there's a lot of challenges with his age and his demeanor and in some of these circumstances that he's seen from the media and, and third parties. Um, and I think that he's really got to portray his leadership to be effective uh, over the last hundred days, and he wants to really establish himself to the American people as a moderate. Um, and he, I, he may even be trying to pick off some of the Republican support on the fringes 
um, in some of these swing districts as such with a pending election coming uh, that he's going to want to try to put some of the Republicans in a very tough manner uh, moving <clears throat> forward. Um, I also think that Biden's oracle, uh, the way he speaks, is, is a little bit of a challenge. He lacks some of the charisma uh, that other, you know, that an Obama had uh, or a George Bush or even even Trump, who's very, you know, can be a powerful speaker. Um, so I really think that um, the way that Obama or Reagan or Clinton offered up their addresses, um, I think that he will um, will try to find his own delivery style. Um, I also think that um, because his speech is later, it really later than any other president, his address, joint address is later than any other president since Reagan. I really think that that is by design because that allows him to take credit for more things that if he had just uh, had, had given the speech in February or J late January. So this is definitely by design to take credit for a lot of the pandemic stuff that was done in the past administration. Um, and, and to really, um, they know from polling and they know from their conversations in Congress where their weak points are moving forward on their agenda. Um, I also think that, um, uh, you know, we're not just going to see a speech that's focused on accomplishments um, in the last hundred days. It's got to set the tone for further, further legislation um, that, you know, he has two major pillars that he's trying to push and tuck any of his projects into. One's the America's Jobs Plan. You know, that dedicates six hundred and twenty one billion in infrastructure repairing the, you know, the country. Um, it, it raises the corporate tax rates, closing the loopholes. And then he has the American Families Plan, uh, providing child care funding and, and tax, you know, um, uh, the tax credits and things like that. So I really think Biden has to show that these are important programs for him to the country. And I think he's going to have a tough time in a Senate that's 50-50. Um, he's got to make unity a central part of his message. Uh, there's no doubt his speechwriters are going to try to to hide some of his policies to the left uh, and make him more of a moderate. Um, and I think he has to make a case to his party internally on why they need to stay united on these plans um, and to keep that reconciliation path open. Um, but I, I don't think that he's going to be able to really come out and, and make a case for why the Republicans should come to the table um, and, and negotiate with the Democrats. I just think that his policies are so far to the left, they're not what the American people are looking for. Um, you know, and I think he has to solidify just just, you know, outside Congress. He has to solidify public support. No doubt they're looking at polling. No doubt they're very carefully crafting these messages. Um, and I think this is also going to be a litmus test for his policies in the public. He's going to use the media um, and what others come out and say against the speech tonight to actually understand what he can do. What can he push? And from the White House perspective and what he has to have Congress push. Remember, he only has passed seven bills uh, this year since coming into office in Congress with, I believe there's about five dozen um, executive orders that he's pushed. So he is rather governed from the pulpit of the White House versus trying to, to work with the American people and their representatives in Congress uh, to, really, to really bridge that gap. Um, I also think that we have to really talk about Biden in the media a little more. Um, you know, his greatest media tool has has been his sense, you know, to very uh, script his media appearances, you know, create a sense of trust by speaking directly into the camera. We saw this on the campaign. We've seen this in a couple high profile White House addresses, particularly on COVID. Um, you know, his voice is soft. It's unassuming and it's husky sometimes. So and he has a little bit of emotion in it. But, you know, the style, um, you know, comes across a little sincere uh, and it w worked well. But he's going to be in a different, different scenario tonight. The trickery of TV won't work in a large room. Uh, it's not going to work tonight with the intimacy that he's used to feeling on the camera. Um, I also think that, you know, his large voice the one that when he gets away and talks to large crowds, doesn't convey that connection with his audience, is go he's going to lose that tonight because of the size of the room and because of the way he has to project his voice into it. 
So I don't think it's going to be as effective um, as we've seen in the past from from his recent speeches. Um, I also find um, I'm going to find it very interesting building on that to see if he can actually come across the screen um, standing and addressing a big room in Capitol and get the bounce in the public that he's looking for. Um, you know, he's he's um, he's kind of set this bar for public engagements very low. Um, and he's put, you know, kind of a minimal effort towards the news media. Um, you know, how much are they going to tolerate uh, moving forward, uh, not having the access to him that they've had in the past to other presidents? Um, the stakes are high. I think um, the speech may not move a lot of policy, but he's looking to win those Republican votes. He's looking to try to at least say that he's unifying Congress. Um, but we all know what's really happening here. Um, and I really think that that, um, you know, moving past his speech tonight, uh, the rebuttal that Tim Scott, Senator Scott will give uh, equally will be as important. Uh, you know, we've seen um, uh, past uh, rebuttal speeches. You know, the difference is you're in a you know, the president is in a room full of Congress, but the rebuttal speech is in an empty room, the cameras. You don't get that energy. You don't get that feel. So with a smaller room, the play in, uh, in Congress, the playing field is a little bit more leveled. Uh, not exactly, but it is. Um, and I think that, um, by, you know, Nikki Haley in 2016, they really catapulted her in the national spotlight. I think we've seen, um, um, you know, 2009 through 11, we had uh, uh, Bobby Jindal, Governor Jindal, uh, McDonald, and Paul Ryan give those rebuttals. Uh, we've seen all three of them sort of fade on the stage. So I think this is really an opportunity for Scott to focus on who he is and where he's from. I'm from South Carolina. We, I heard y'all talk about Senator Thurman. He's a legend in our state. I was fortunate enough to know him when I was younger. And, and Senator Scott is a great representative of our state, you know, he comes from very humble, uh, humble beginnings and he's very proud of who he is. So I think that tonight he may have the edge on that emotion uh, and that and that push that the Republicans are looking for. Uh, and I think it will offset and counterbalance Biden very well. Hey, thanks, Chris. I think this, uh, yeah, this may be the first time that the guy or the person giving the rebuttal uh, we'll have an opportunity to have an equal presence as a president, uh, you know, in a, uh, you know, the rebuttal never could meet the expect or what the reality of what the president had, a full chamber in the House of Representatives. Tonight, it's going to be very, very different. Uh, I want to come just back to one point on the on the foreign policy stuff. Uh, and Peter, if you can, Gail, if you would address your thoughts on this, you know, my fear is, and we remember, Peter, when we talked about bugs and bunnies uh, in the Intel Committee when uh, under the Obama administration, they moved climate change to one of the national security threats. You know, my fear is, and we've seen this, they're back, the administration, we're back in the climate deal. Uh, China and India have said, we're not going to participate. Good luck. Uh, they're going to look for some kind of a win with China, maybe with India, but especially with China. What do you think the opportunity is or the likelihood that they'll sell us out uh, on some economic issues to try to get some type of concession um, from China on climate? Yeah, as I said, I think at least he's been saying the right things on China, You know, a lot of the right things on China, but he is so desperate for an agreement. He's so desperate to... Uh, make climate change such a vibrant, vital issue uh, when there's people all over the world trying to kill us, but he's concerned about you know, the climate as the top issue, and that he may well be willing to make concessions on China. That has to be watched very carefully, and uh, Republicans have to be really on the alert and do it in a responsible way. But uh, China, I'm sure, is going to be listening very carefully also to see just how much he feels he has to have a, a, a climate accord with China the way he's made clear he has to have a nuclear accord with Iran. Uh, you know, this is not a world full of nice guys. And we, especially when it comes to, you know, even allies can be tough. But with adversaries, they they look upon any sign of goodwill as being weakness, unless you can back it up the way Reagan did and the way Trump did. So uh, I, I think it's not only what we see, but what is, what is China going to see, what is India going to see, especially China. Gil? Well, in, in terms of the, the Green New Deal, 
um, I think it's a heavy lift, okay? It may well be that the media and uh, Hollywood and, and everyone, and, and, and now even the, the big uh, auto companies have bought into the, the notion that we're all going to drive electric cars and that uh, the Green New Deal is going to be a wonderful thing. I think the reality is much different. And I think as people begin to see, as I pointed out with this video from PragerU, when you begin to look at the real costs of this conversion that the Biden administration and others are calling for, um, I think it, as we go forward, the Green New Deal will become in, incredibly less popular. And I think the idea that you will be able to ever get the Chinese to agree to anything that's real uh, in terms of setting standards and, and going forward, I think the Chinese are more than eager to talk about long-term goals and that you know their objectives and that they're going to build more wind towers. But but they know the numbers too, uh, and and the numbers make it very very difficult to maintain the kind of standard of living that we have enjoyed and that the Chinese want to enjoy, and and be able to hit the kind of uh, Green New Deal standards that that uh, the administration points out. So. I think we'll see a real sales job tonight on the Green New Deal, but I think as we go forward, uh, that's going to be a harder and harder lift. And let me add one other point. I am incredibly disappointed at how the, the large energy companies are dealing with all of this. Um, I don't think, you know, th they have some obligation. Let me put it this way. I think the energy companies, and I'm talking principally about the oil and, and gas industries, they have a very good story to tell, and they just haven't told it. And they've really allowed uh, you know, others to sort of dominate <laughs> the public discourse about this, but I, I still believe that facts are stubborn things, and that ultimately the facts point out that we're gonna be in a hydrocarbon economy for at least the next 40 to 50 years. And I think that's basically a good thing. I think it's not only a good thing for the economics and, and for the, the, the prosperity of our people, but I also think, believe it or not, that it's good for the environment because the, the, the technologies that are going to be required to move to the Green New Deal uh, are going to require mining all kinds of rare earth elements all over the world in very dangerous situations. It's going to require a whole lot of things that the president and the, the advocates of Green New Deal uh, they don't want to talk about. So I think we'll see a sales job on it, but uh, I think as we go forward, the, the lift becomes heavier. All right. Uh, thanks, guys. Um, we're going to turn it over. Uh, we're going to welcome Adam back. Uh, we'll let uh, our viewers know how they can submit questions. Uh, Adam, do you have any questions that have been submitted? We got plenty of good ones. So okay. let's go here. Biden campaigned as a moderate, but is pushing through a lot of the progressive agenda under the guise of COVID relief or infrastructure. Republicans used to be the party of small government and concerned about the debt. They don't seem to be pushing back on spending. Why do you think that's happening and do you expect it to change? Gil, Peter, you're, Gil, you and I served together on the budget committee. Uh, you know, the three of us were there when we actually balanced the budget. Uh, your thoughts on that? We'll keep the answer short uh, so we can get to as many questions as possible. I, I well, would say the main know, reason that there's not more opposition right now is that in the public eye, they do believe money is needed for COVID. Infrastructure sounds good. And it's going to be up to the Republicans to point out how much is in there that is unrelated to COVID, unrelated to infrastructure, and just going to set up permanent welfare programs. But on the, on the face of it, on the surface of it, to the average person, do you want more money? Do you want to be safe from COVID? Do you want to have better bridges and tunnels? People are going to say yes. And uh, the actual cost of it is something, you know, so much money has been spent in the last year. A lot of it justified, some of it not. But so much is out there that it no longer has the impact that it did on the, on the, on the, on the uh, body politic. So we have to find an intelligent way to show how this goes way beyond COVID, way beyond infrastructure. And it's really just a grab bag of liberal ideas, but do it in a way that doesn't make it sound as if we don't care about infrastructure and we don't care about COVID. So we really have to be on this because this is a time bomb uh, I don't know where this money can ever be repaid at the, at the rate it's going, especially if his plans were adopted. 
Well, I would say that we have to become much better communicators, okay? I mean, again, I think there's a good story to be told, but Republicans really aren't telling it. I do agree with Peter that right now the zeitgeist, uh, the spirit of the time seems to be, you know, that we need to do this, we need to do this with COVID and, and so forth. And uh, I think the public and the Republicans' eye has sort of been taken off the ball. But again, I, I think they have to come up with relatively simple messages uh and say and, and say one of the things they the problems we've always faced and that is we do a miserable job of telling our story okay and part of it is that we don't we're unwilling to repeat the story and and i think part of the story is here again washington is spending money that they do not have on programs that have demonstrated they cannot work and that that ultimately are going to have negative consequences uh, for a lot of the very people they're trying to help, but they need to keep telling that story. We did that with welfare reform. We did it when we balanced the budget. We kept telling the story and telling the story, retelling the story. Uh, for example, with uh, you remember Peter, or both of you, Peters, uh, when we had the contract with America, every day in the one minutes we reread the contract with America. Every day we retold our story of what we were trying to do and why we were trying to do it. And uh, we've got to get back to some of those basic principles. And finally, let me also add, I think outside groups, including this one, uh, have to do a better job of helping to tell that story too. We can't rely just on the members of Congress, especially when their, their story has to be filtered through uh, the, the, uh, the lens of the national media. The national media is not particularly friendly to Republicans in general and conservatives in particular. And so outside groups have got to help tell that story. And I, my hats are off to people like Greg or you and others who are helping to tell that story. Uh, we need more of them. There are uh, increasing reports that China is preparing to attack Taiwan this decade. Do you think the US military is in the shape to respond? And does this administration have the credibility to respond effectively? With the... Uh Right now, the military, yes, it is, but the rate China's uh, increase is much more than ours. Uh, Taiwan definitely needs more defensive weapons. And uh, the president, uh, again, he's been saying the right things on Taiwan, but I think we have to improve more weapons sales in Taiwan. And I think the U.S. military certainly needs more. You know, you, when you listen to the admirals, especially the admirals, who have a lot uh, you know, with the uh, Taiwan Straits and everything, this is something that is, is a major, major issue. And when you have Trump again trying to, I mean, excuse me, when you have Biden trying to walk away from everything President Trump did, and President Trump probably had more contact with Taiwan than any president probably since Eisenhower. And, uh, but that is, that could well be the turning point of the next 10 years as to what China does with Taiwan. And if we don't, if we don't sound more determined and more coherent in our policies, I think that is going to act not as deterrent to China at all but almost as an encouragement. I, I would agree with that. And uh, let me just add one other thing in terms of my concern about the future of our military is too many of our military leaders have become so concerned about diversity and being woke that I'm not sure that we're the war fighting machine that we were even five years ago. Uh, and so you're really dealing with two issues. You're dealing with uh, American will but you're also dealing with a, a, an American military that, that is different today than it was five years ago. And, and not that the people, that 99% of the people inside the military haven't really changed, but the military leadership is, I, I'm, I'm really concerned about the kind of people that we're hearing from in the Pentagon uh, on a wide variety of issues that have much more to do with social issues than with our war fighting ability. Do you think Biden's foreign policy is satisfying to his far left? And if not, will he come under more pressure? I think so far it's been satisfying to the far left because they feel he's going in their direction. And he can only go so far though, and that's when the far left may turn on him. But uh, right now, I mean, his, his whole tone, again, except with Asia, he sounds so much tough in Asia. The rest of it though, is just being anti-Trump. And uh, the far left though, the AOCs of the world, the Bernie Sanders of the world, uh, they, uh, whether it's defund the police or whether it's uh, you know, defund the military, that, that, you know, that is what they're looking for, a nice, you know, nice one-world government. So uh, I think it's only a matter of time before 
he does hit a wall with the left. I just hope that's what damage is done. So national security. What happens. Yeah, if you look at national security, security border, <clears throat> climate, Iran in Israel uh, is why you've got AOC and others on the left saying, wow, this has been a pleasant surprise uh, where this administration is going. Next question. What do you think, what do you expect from Biden in the next 100 days? From my perspective, I think it's going to be all uh, domestic policy. Chris, you've got a thought? I do. I think he's going to try to push these two plans on his infrastructure, his taxes. Um, I think he's going to have to touch on national security uh, because of China, the Middle East, Israel. Um, but I don't think it's his priority. Uh, I think we're seeing the same priorities when Obama came in in 2008, 2009, but they were program, their domestic programs. I do think that, that Biden will have a challenge both with the left uh, and within his own party uh, and also with the Republicans, uh, given the midterm elections coming up. I think his agenda uh, will have to change by the end of the year to begin setting up for the, for the midterms. Do you think Biden's history of pushing the Russia hoax will make war with Russia over Ukraine more likely? Peter? Yeah, I, uh, I'm i not certain what his policy to it, uh, Russia is. I'm not sure what Putin was up to by moving the troops to the border, but not at the Ukrainian border, but not uh, increasing his uh, uh, supply capability. I, I think this is a push back and forth between Putin and uh, 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 Biden, and there's the whole thing with you know, the, you know, the Russia hoax was a hoax, and I, I mean, you know, we knew that from the start. We knew there was never anything to that at all. How Putin's going to play that? How uh, Biden intends to continue to play it? I, I don't know, and that's part of the uncertainty. I mean, he has to, because uh, Russia is definitely emerging. They're not going to be the threat they were during the Cold War, but they still are a major. You know, it's a major nuclear power, and they straddle uh, Europe and Asia. And uh, other countries, you know, they 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 sense where the where the uh, power is shifting. So, uh, and that's why you do see uh, more of the European leaders, including the French, talking about that Europe is going to have to do more to defend itself. Now, that may sound like it's uh, like a help to the U.S. that uh, won't be as much for the U.S. to do. The reality is, it means that we're losing some of our power, and we have to maintain some level of control over these issues before they get out of hand. So, I would say Russia. I put that in the uncertain category. Yeah. All right. I think that'll have to be the last one. So, uh, Pete, if you just want to take a couple minutes to wrap up, and uh, I'll have some announcements. All right. Uh, Chris, uh, Peter, Gil, okay. thank you very much for joining us. Uh, yeah. To the uh, the audience that uh, was with us today, we hope that this has been informative and helpful. Uh, we're going to be doing these on a, on a regular basis, bringing in various experts from our uh, advisory board. Uh, we'll have a short. Uh, we'll have a short presentation discussions and then opening up for uh, for questions but thank you very much for uh, for joining us adam we will turn it over to you for uh, talking about and introducing the uh, i think uh, the next webinar from the center for security policy sure well we are off next wednesday but we'll return in two weeks that's wednesday may 12th at 1 p.m we'll be welcoming mike pompeo for an in-depth uh, discussion of biden's national security policies and that'll be moderated by the center president, Fred Flights, and our senior analyst, Dr. David Wormser. Uh, we enjoyed having you all here today. Remember that the center's important work is only possible because of your generous support. If you do enjoy these programs as much as I do, please visit our website at securefreedom.org. Click on the big red donate button in the upper right corner. You can make an instant contribution by credit card and get information about other methods of giving. Thanks again to our guests. We'll see everyone else here in two weeks with Mike Pompeo. Thanks Great. a lot. Very much. Thank you.